Heavenly God, we thank you that you have poured out your spirit on your people. And so we pray, Lord, that your spirit would illumine our hearts and illumine the text of scripture that we look at this morning. Give us wisdom, give us insight, give us understanding. Help us to take what we learn and put it in practice in our lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This weekend in the Jewish calendar is celebrated uh, as Shavuot. Um, and it is literally the Hebrew word for weeks. It is the festival of weeks. And it's a big deal. It's one of the big holidays in the Jewish liturgical year. Liturgy is the work of the people. It's the things that they do, the words that they say, the, the following of the order of worship um, that the Jewish people lived by. And that Jewish calendar helped form them as a nation. And so the Jews gathered in celebration of weeks. What are the weeks? There were seven weeks between the Passover, when God rescued his people, took them from slavery in Egypt, and seven weeks later, he gave them the Torah. He gave them the law. They had been the ancient Hebrew people, a ragtag bunch of slaves, and by the giving of the law, God formed them into the Jewish nation. They became a people, and their people were built upon a constitution of principles and laws and values. And embedded in these ideas are some lessons that might be applicable today. First, we need the law. Human beings left to their own devices wander off uh, down rabbit trails and uh, off the road. I remember driving in the Rocky Mountains and uh, there was a guardrail. And I thank God there was a guardrail. I mean, I'd come around a curve and I would look down and I couldn't see what was down there. It was a sheer drop, but it's great that there's a guardrail. So I just hug the guardrail and stay in my lane and I can get through the Rocky Mountains. Well, life is the Rocky Mountains. God gave his people the law. He gave them a guardrail. He gave them principles to live by. And we live in an age where we want to cast off the law. We want to defund the police. We want to decriminalize criminal behavior. These are bad ideas. They're bad ideas formed by minds that haven't been formed by the Judeo-Christian foundation upon which our nation was built. God gave at Shavuot. He gave the law to his people. He could have given his law to them just as they crossed over the Jordan River and they were a new people away from Egypt and he could have started then, but he made them wait seven weeks. Delayed gratification. It's a principle that our culture doesn't do very well with. Uh, we, many of us grew up with that, uh, but we don't do well with that anymore. Um, and it involves uh, waiting. It involves effort. So they were to count the days of Shavuot, of the various weeks, of the seven weeks, until from Passover until the celebration of Moses giving them the law from God. The law which transformed them, gave them a mission, gave them principles by which to lead their lives, gave them an identity as a people, and changed their destiny and that of the whole world forever. I mean, we've got the Ten Commandments. These are the, the undergirding of all societies. C.S. Lewis, in one of his books, challenged you to think about what would it look like if uh, you lived in a society that did the opposite of the Ten Commandments? You shall kill. You shall steal. You, you have no society. I mean, this is God's gift, not just to the Jewish people, but through the Jewish people, God's gift to the whole world. And again, it involves some effort. What would our nation be like if all middle school students were required to take seven weeks to remember and learn their civics? What would our nation be like if all those who take a vow to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States uh, were required to take seven weeks to study the Constitution, to actually read the document, to understand what was in it and why it was placed there? You know, we might still have some bad leaders with some bad ideas, but I bet we'd have a few less bad leaders with a few less bad ideas. This was God's gift to the Jewish people in the giving of the law at Shavuot. So, what kind of car did the apostles drive? 
It says in Acts 2.14 that on the day of Pentecost, they were all together in one accord. They drove a Honda. <laughs> the Jewish holiday, the Jewish celebration of the Festival of Weeks is called by Christians Pentecost. Fifty days between Easter and the crescendo of God's victory at Pentecost at the pouring out of His Spirit. And Christians in emulation of the Jews have tried to put together their own liturgical calendar. They've tried to um, live their lives in a rhythm similar to the Jewish people and their festivals and feasts. So this is the Feast of Pentecost and it's one of the biggies on the Christian calendar. Um, and we've kind of dumbed the calendar down and not too many people do all of those feasts and reminders and celebrations. Um, you know, the apostles weren't doing anything new or radical or relevant or innovative. They were being who they were, Jewish people. What did Jews do at Shavuot? They gather together. They spend time together being together. They are remembering all of the ways in which God has been active on their behalf, on the ways in which God has worked for them, the ways in which God is working in the world. And by their presence, they're making themselves available to what God might do in their midst and among them. And so that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. They gathered for Shavuot. They gathered for the festival of weeks. And the Holy Spirit came upon them and rushed among them. And they went from not a ragtag bunch of slaves into a nation, but a ragtag bunch of disciples into the church of Jesus Christ. And within a generation, they had taken the gospel to the four corners of the Roman Empire because it was a big festival. So the Jews from the diaspora, the spreading out of the Jews through the empire, they came home for Passover. They came home for the Festival of Weeks. And on that day, Peter got up and he preached a sermon and 3,000 were converted. They went from 120 to 3,000 in one day, 2,500% growth in one day. A sign that God is alive, that God is true, that God is active, that God is at work in their midst. And the Jews who had come to Jerusalem for the celebration went back home and they took the gospel with them. And if you read through the 26 chapters of the book of Acts, it started in Jerusalem and then it went to Judea and Samaria, even to the uttermost parts of the earth. Within a generation, God had done all of that through his people by the pouring out of his spirit. And so on this day, we remember that our God is a God who is alive, who is active, who is at work. He pours out his spirit on his people. And as he gave the Jews the Torah, the law, the Bible, so he has given us his spirit. As he gave the Jews a mission and a ministry and a witness in the world, so he has given his church a ministry in the world, a witness. He's given them a mission to accomplish. Jesus, when gathered with his disciples, said, Go into the whole world and make disciples. Or better yet, as you are going. It's not a command. It's a participle. As you are going, make disciples wherever you are, whether you're at the grocery store or whether you're at the gas station or whether you're driving down the road or at the traffic circle. I know. I know. But as you are going, make disciples. And so that's the ministry and mission that he's given the church. And he's given us his spirit in order to empower us to do what he has commanded us to do. God never tells us to do something without providing the resources by which we are to do the thing that he's told us to do. And so we celebrate that. Now my question this morning on Pentecost is, have you met that God? The true God, the living God, the active God. Just a few minutes ago, we stood up and we affirmed our faith in this God. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. This is the God that we worship. Have you met him like Moses met him at the burning bush? Have you met him like Jacob met him at Peniel? Have you met him like Elijah met him at Mount Carmel? And before you tell me, no, no, I've never had an experience like that, I'm going to tell you, yes, yes, you have. Look out the window. 
Paul says, for since the creation of the world, God has made himself known, his eternal nature, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, have been clearly seen being understood through what he has made so that human beings are without an excuse. Human beings can't be godless. We may deny God with our lips and say there is no God, but in order to do that, the very breath in our lungs was put there by God. And so we look out at the world that God has provided for us. And God, again, is reminding us and demonstrating to us that He is alive and active and at work. Not only did He make it and create it, but He sustains it day by day, minute by minute. Without His sovereign care of His creation, it would spin into nothingness in no time at all. Our text this morning, we've been studying the Psalms. Our text this morning is Psalm 104. And so if you'd like to follow along with me, you'll find that on page 503. It's not the entirety of the Psalm. We're going to look at the last third of it, give or take. Um, and this is a Psalm about a celebration of what we just got up and confessed. I believe in God, the maker of heaven and earth. This is a celebration of the creator, the God, the maker of heaven and earth. That's what this whole psalm is about. It echoes, it mimics the creation narrative in Genesis 1 and 2. It follows the same kind of outline. Verse 1 is uh, introductory words, but they're words of praise. Verses 2 to 4, he, he gives expression to the beauty and the, the majesty of the sky, and then the earth, and then vegetation, and then the, the waters, and then the animals. And he's following the narrative from Genesis until he gets to our portion of Scripture this morning. And it's Psalm 100. And four, beginning at verse 24. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works! How many, how variegated are your works! It is a summary of all that has gone before about what the psalmist has said about animals and vegetation. You know, God didn't make one kind of tree, He didn't make one kind of bush, He didn't make one kind of grass. He made manifold numbers of all of those things. God didn't make one kind of animal. He made salamanders, and he made snakes, and he made kangaroos, and he made giraffes and platypuses. How manifold, says the psalmist, are your works. It's a summary of all the verses that we didn't read up to the point where we are. And then it pushes us forward to continue to consider all of the various ways that God has demonstrated his creativity his magnificence, his glory. He's glorified in the things that he has made. And the psalmist continues, O oh Lord, how manifold, how many, how variegated are your works in wisdom. You have made them all. That he gives credit where credit is due. He's giving credit to the God who made all of these things, who came up with all of these ideas. I am not a creative person. If I sat down and I had to come up and draw some animals and come up with some ideas, I'd never come up with a platypus and a giraffe. I'd never come up with a kangaroo and a lion. I, I, I couldn't come up with these things. God is utterly amazing if we just stop for a moment and think about what He has done. Let me challenge you to look out the window. Have you met this God? Maybe not like Moses at the burning bush, but God has made himself known to us through the things that he has made. And the psalmist continues, here is the sea. So he's done the waters, the rivers, and the streams. Now he's doing the sea. Now remember that the Jews are a desert people. I had a friend who, he's, he's in his 50s, and you know, if somebody has a birthday party and they have a pool in their backyard, he wouldn't go. He never learned to swim. And he was literally afraid, palpably afraid of somebody might jokingly push him in and he would drown because he doesn't know how to swim. He didn't go near the river. He didn't go near a pool. I mean, he proscribed his life. He pulled his life in on itself and didn't enjoy the fullness of life because he was afraid. Well, the Jewish people were afraid of the waters. Go back and read Genesis. Um, the Spirit hovered over the waters and everything was formless and void. There wasn't a place to stand. It was void. It was empty. Oh my gosh, and don't throw me in the deep end of the pool. Oh dear. And that's, that's the way the Jewish people were. And yet they recognized that God had made the, the great sea. And in the sea, he put the sea monster. The sea monster is called Leviathan. 
And so in, the, in his creation, in his sea, here he's talking about um, where to go. Here is the sea, great and wide. And then in verse 28, in Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. And then the psalmist does something interesting, because this is not in Genesis. Verse 26, there go the ships. We're sub-creators. J.R.R. Tolkien, the, the creator of Middle Earth, the creator of The Hobbit and uh, The Lord of the Rings, he considered himself to be a sub-creator. Just as God was a great creator and came up with all these kinds of animals and plants and varieties of life, so as a sub-creator, he made it his job to create another world, Middle Earth, and to populate it with orcs and hobbits and all kinds of creatures that, that we don't have in our world. And so, sub-creator, I was making a point there, but it escapes me now what it was. There go the ships. So. This is something that humanity comes up with. They make these wonders. We've got all kinds of crazy and great inventions. Apple watches. Christian starts his car from the balcony using his watch. I recommend counseling. Um, <clears throat> doesn't need a key. All he needs is his watch. Um, you know, crazy stuff that human beings make. And I just saw in the paper last week um, that Jeff Bezos, the guy from Amazon, the richest man in the world, he's commissioned the world's greatest, richest, biggest, best yacht. But imagine a yacht and no sea to put it in. So even our creativity, even our best gifts, they come and they float on God's gifts to us. God provides the sea. We might provide the ship that's on the sea, but, but we do that as a sub-creator. We do that as in mimicking the God who creates and the God who does all of these things. And then verses 27 through 30, and this is what ties it to Pentecost, talks about the Spirit of God and how God is active in His world, sustaining the world that He has made. And that Hebrew word is ruach. And it's like the Greek word, pneuma, and they both mean the same thing. They mean spirit, like Holy Spirit. They mean spirit, like you have a spirit within you. They mean breath, as you breathe in and out. Ruach, pneuma, it's the same thing. It's breath, and it is also wind. So we go back to the Holy Spirit celebrating the birthday of the church, creating the church out of this ragtag 120. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were sitting. God's Spirit at work and active in the world. It's not a once and done, he did it on Pentecost and he never does it again. Creation wasn't a once and done and he did it and now he doesn't have anything to do with his creation. We are not followers of the God of deism. He built the clock, he wound it up, and now he's wandered off to do something else. No, our God is intimately involved with the creation that he made, and he enjoys his creation. He says about the animals and the creation, these all look to you. Without God, none of this is, is there. None of it hangs together. You give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open up your hand, they are filled with good things. So God is the one who provides for us in big ways and small ways. I know you think you provided for yourself. You went to work, you got a paycheck, you cashed it, you took it to the grocery store, you bought food, you put it in your refrigerator, and you think you did all that. No, you didn't. You didn't grow the corn. You didn't grow the, the, the cow and the steak and all the stuff that's in your refrigerator. God provided all of that. Human beings have never created a, a new thing. We monkey around with God, what, what God has made, and we make chimeras. We mingle the DNA from humans with pigs and monkeys. And uh, I'm with Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park. We've discovered that we can do it, would somebody please ask the question whether or not we should do it? Of course we shouldn't do it. Um, God is the one who put all of that together, and we are playing as if we are God, and that, that is not a good deal. So what happens when God, verse 29, hides his face? 
The whole of creation groans. Paul says that it groans like a woman in labor, in travail, in the pain of childbirth. If God were just to look away for just a moment, the whole of creation groans. What would happen if God were to turn his back and walk away? Well, it says right here what would happen. When you take away their breath, they die, and they return to their dust. Where do human beings come from? God took the dust of the earth, and he formed it into a man, and then he breathed the breath, ruach. He breathed the breath, the spirit of life into the man, and that's where man came from. That's where creation came from. God, creation, ex nihilo, out of nothing, made all that there is. We just affirmed it a few minutes ago, but do we think about what we're affirming? I believe in God, the creator of heaven and earth. When you send forth your spirit, then they're created. It's God's creative impulse through his spirit. St. Augustine said that in creation, God the Father had two hands. It was the Son, the Logos, so God spoke. That was the Logos, and it was. And the other hand was the Spirit who hovered over the waters where everything was formless and void, and it became the thing that God intended it to be, that God was the potter, and he was working this lump of clay and making out of it all of the various things. We go back to the first verse, 24. O Lord, how manifold are your works. So verse 30, uh, 30, when you send forth your spirit, they're created, and you renew the face of the ground. If God withholds his spirit, it all, it, it all turns to dust. It all blows away. It ceases to exist. This is our God. He's a creator, and he is the sustainer of what he has made. And then the, the psalm closes out, verses 31 through 35, with, with two petitions, two prayers, and then two proclamations. And the first petition is there in verse 31. Uh, May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. I have a two-year-old grandson, and um, my little man is awesome. And, and he gets a toy, and, you know, he sleeps with the toy, and he goes to preschool with the toy, and he carries the toy with him in the car, and he, he goes everywhere with the toy for about a week. And then the toy becomes kind of old hat, and so it gets replaced by something else, by a different toy. And here's the psalmist prayer, oh God, please don't be a two-year-old. Don't get bored with what you have made. Don't put it aside. Don't turn about your back to it. Don't walk away because it'll all fall to dust. Continue to be involved with your creation. Continue to sustain it and to bless it the way that you have from the time that you have made it. And then the other petition is found in verse 35. Now, the guys who put together the Revised Common Lectionary come from the mainline churches, and they are uh, typically of the more progressive and liberal stripe. And there are certain things in the Bible that they don't like, um, and among those things is sin and punishment for sin. So I'm supposed to read to you only 35b, but not 35a. Well, you remember, and you're not old enough, when you remember when Lady Chatterley's Lover came out and it was so scandalous and the book was banned. The Justice Department said it can't be imported into America. So what happened? Black market copies went everywhere. Everybody wanted to read Lady Chatterley's Lover because that was such a dirty book, it was banned. What's in that book? We gotta see that book. Why? Well, that's me. What's in, what's in uh, 35a that they took out that I can't read? 35a, let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Yikes. But, but there's a recognition by the psalmist. What's the spanner in the works? Humanity, human depravity, sin. What messes up? God's creation, human beings. You know, God created everything. Go back to Genesis. Good, 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 good. He made it all wonderful, and it all worked in harmony. And then human beings rebelled against God, shook their fist at the heavens, and told God to hang it on his beak. And as a result, not only did they fall, and we have inherited original sin, but the whole of creation has fallen with us. And now it doesn't operate. Paul says in Romans 8 that it groans. It's awaiting the consummation, the revelation of the sons of men. It's, it's groaning now. How's it groaning? There are earthquakes, and there are hurricanes, and there are tidal waves, and there are all these things that God didn't put into the original creation, but because of our sin, because of the brokenness that we brought and ushered into the creation, the whole of creation fell, not just human beings. 
But the whole of creation fell. And so there's an acknowledgement. Let sinners be consumed from the earth. That, oh goodness gracious. By, the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if God answers this prayer, I'm gone and so are you. Um, there isn't one righteous, not even one. There's none who understands. There's none who seek for God. Together, humani humanity is useless. That's, that's the witness of Scripture. And yet, this God who created is a God who comes to us in mercy and in grace and in kindness. In Romans 2, Paul said, it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance. Hellfire and damnation doesn't scare people into heaven. It's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. It's this God who creates and who sustains and who blesses us even when we don't deserve it. What kind of God is this? Not good parenting. So we do bad things, but God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He causes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. If we knew who these sinners were, we'd know because there could be a little black cloud that hovers over their head with lightning coming down and zapping them in the back of the head. And then we'd know who these sinners are. God doesn't do that. He causes His blessings to fall on the wicked as well as the good. And so here, here we are. And so the prayer is remove this humanity. No, God has gone one better. God has redeemed this humanity. God has sent his son Jesus to die for our sin. God has paid the price of redemption and brought us home. He has taken us from being slaves, slaves to sin. He's taken us from being a ragtag bunch of disciples and converted us and made us into the bride of Christ. This is what our creative spirit God does in the world and in the church. So he doesn't do that. And then there are two proclamations in these final verses, giving glory to God. Um, verse 33, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. You know, what's our response when we look out at all of the blessings that God has given us? We look out in the world that he has made. Do we ever take time? You know, <laughs> Our entertainment culture kills us. We binge on TV shows rather than take a walk at the park. We, we do all kinds of things rather than just simply look out at what God has made. I want to close with just this final image. An older woman, alone, living in her home alone. She gets out of bed early in the morning just as the sun is coming up over the horizon. And the sun begins to illuminate the garden that she planted at the foot of her porch. And she steps out on her porch and she sees the sun coming. And a cool summer breeze in the morning comes as a kiss on her cheek. And she looks at the beautiful colors in the garden that she, she has made. And her response is our final verse. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord for another day of life. Praise the Lord. Bless the Lord for verse 24. For what? For how manifold are your works and how you made them in your wisdom. The appropriate, the proper response to this God, the God who is at work in the world, who is at work in the church, who is at work in our lives, is praise and worship. Happy Pentecost. Amen.